Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think anybody knows particularly, but I think, you know, the, the various speculations on endogenous DMT that it modulates dreams, for example, or the notion that it has to do with uh, regulating your degree of focus on inner states versus external states and the synthesis of those things. I mean, it seems that really seems to be what it's what it does in a sense. It's a uh, it's part of this filtering mechanism, or it's it it when you take it in physiologically, you know, large doses beyond what what it would what would happen endogenously, uh, then you see this full manifestation of the effect. You you see this disruption of this reality compiling function. Um, you know why. DMT uh, is endogenous. Uh, I mean, why DMT, why it's out there at all, you know, is, uh, <clears throat> is a question. In, in some ways, it's a trivial question. You know, obviously our brains are a reflection of, of evolution and our genetic complement and and you know these neurotransmitter like substances are they permeate nature and uh and DMT particularly uh you know permeates nature which is uh which is strange in itself and a whole other uh level of significance for the compound in in uh you know to my mind is that you know one of the things besides what it does one of the things about DMT that uh, that always fascinated me was the fact that it's such a simple molecule and it biosynthetically it's two steps from tryptophan right uh, two trivial enzymatic steps from tryptophan well tryptophan is an amino acid, of course, and it's everywhere. It's one of the, the 20 that goes up to make proteins. So all organisms have tryptophan, and all organisms have the, the two key enzymes that lead to the synthesis of DMT. They have the aromatic amino acid decarboxylases and the and methyltransferases. One of them converts tryptophan to tryptamine, and the other one does the further transformation to the methylated tryptamines. And these enzymes are very ancient enzymes. They're all over the place. They're, again, part of basic metabolism. So theoretically, anything could synthesize DMT. Bacteria could synthesize it, and undoubtedly do. Uh, we just haven't found any, or we, we haven't found any because we haven't looked, probably. And that's true of <clears throat> a lot of the places where, we, where it's known to occur. You know, we know maybe now we know maybe 150 species of plants, for example, that contain DMT. Uh, that's only because we've looked for it. I'm utterly convinced that there are thousands of species of plants that contain it that we just don't know about because nobody's bothered to look. Um, I, sometimes I speculate that, you know, if you looked at any plant, if you looked at any plant with sufficiently sensitive equipment, you would find it, uh, which, you know, not least of all, creates a real conundrum for the regulatory people, you know, that want to want to eradicate it or ban it. I mean, it's a zero-sum game because, you know, it's everywhere. It permeates the biological world. It permeates the biological kingdom. And something that is that powerful and that ubiquitous must have an important role to play. And, you know, what that is, I don't know. I think 
that partly depends on, on you know, what level uh, we're talking about because, you know, I mean, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a phytochemist. I study plant secondary compounds, and plants make, you know, the, this enormous diversity of chemistries of all sorts, you know, flavonoids, alkaloids, phenolics, and so on. And there used to be, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom 30, 40 years ago was that these things had no real function. They were just sort of physiological noise that the plant made these, these compounds. But that's a very naive understanding. And what we now more understand is that these secondary compounds are, in a sense, the language of plants. In fact, there's a book called The Lost Language of Plants, which is very interesting that, that talks about this. But these are messenger molecules, and they, th this is what plants use to mediate their relationships with other organisms in the environment. And it depends on what's interacting and at what, at what level, right? For example, uh, you know, take an example of, say, the beta-carbolines, which are, you know, close relatives of DMT, and as we know, they're MAO inhibitors and they potentiate DMT, but beta-carbolines are very good antivirals and antibacterial compounds, and plants need to protect themselves from infections in the roots, and, and they're constantly being, uh, you know, attacked by, uh, you know, fungi, bacteria, herbivores that want to eat them, uh, insects that want to pollinate them, all of these interactions that, you know, I mean, you look at an ecosystem, and the ecosystem is really uh, held together and regulated by these molecular messages that are going back and forth. And uh, so if they have, so in some sense, DMT, something like DMT, on one level, maybe it's a good germination inhibitor. I mean, we know this. You know, it's a relatively good germination inhibitor, and plants have, you know, strategies for maximizing their territory and, and inhibiting germination you know, of even their own species in proximity. Well, DMT is a good candidate for that. I mean, there are other things that do that, but DMT does that, you know. Uh, another speculation is that, you know, the, the uh, like uh, snails and things like that have a serotonergic neuromuscular junction. So theoretically, uh, DMT should be, or psilocybin, we thought about it in, in terms of the fact that snails love mushrooms. Well, psilocybin, which is a derivative of DMT, to a snail should be a, a, a paralytic neurotoxin. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever looked, but I think it's a, an interesting question. And so on that level, they're defensive compounds. But, but on the level, when it comes to the point of interacting with more complex organisms like us, with complex nervous systems, maybe it's a, I mean, then on that level, the message is different, uh, you know, it, but it, it's still a message, and maybe what it is is a, a uh, essentially a, a pheromone or a hormone that, uh, mediates the plant's relationship with the primates, you know, with with a primate. Because for a plant to essentially, you know, we find something useful about plants that contain DMT. They get us off, or they open other dimensions, or they they trigger this religious you know, and, and transcendent experiences, something we find value in. As a result, we tend to form these evolutionary symbioses with the plants. And it's in the plant's best interest, in a way. I mean, it's not that they 
they're actively thinking about it. It's not that kind of relationship, but it's, it's <clears throat> evolutionarily speaking, it's in the plant's interest to form a relationship with a primate and become domesticated. And uh, as long as it's a domestic plant, it kind of has an evolutionary free ride, at least as long as we're around until we succeed in totally destroying the planet. You know, but for now, um, you know, this symbiosis is maintained. And, and I think that's what you see. That's the effect of uh, a lot of these secondary chemicals when it, comes to, when it comes to interacting with primates. They are essentially, uh, you know, we value the plant in a lot of ways because of its chemical properties. We wouldn't be interested in it otherwise. It's either a nutrient or a drug or a color or something that, you know, we find useful. And DMT is one of those, you know, and that's the evolutionary strategy that it's adopted, you know, domesticate me and ingest me in the right circumstances with the right MAO inhibitors and all that. And you know, I'll show you how to build starships <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. But in other words, that may be what's going on in a, in a certain sense that, you know, these things. And I, I do uh, have a, uh, you know, a strong intuition, no, no real science behind it, but, but uh, you know, from experiences with ayahuasca, um, and, and DMT certainly, and to a certain degree, some of these other things. I really do think that, in a way, the, 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 you know, the community of species, if you want to say it that way, Gaia or the collective intelligence of life on the planet, is, def is desperately trying to send a message to our species, to this out-of-control primate with this hypertrophy brain and this, you know, experiment that got out of control in a way and is now threatening, you know, the very existence of life on the planet and, and the biosphere is trying to say, you know, hold on, cowboy, wait a minute, you know, there's some neat things we need to show you so that you wake up.